Well, we're very lucky to be joined by Connie Hedegaard today. Thank you very much for, for joining us um, and agreeing to speak to us in your capacity as chair of the new mission board on adaptation and societal resilience in the EU. Um, we're interested to see that, uh, as expressed in its revamped climate adaptation strategy from earlier this year, and then the related Horizon Mission Programme, the Commission now recognises the critical importance of transformation towards climate resilience, as well as a climate neutral Europe, and, and an interesting kind of slight shift of emphasis there. So, what broadly would you say are the implications for EU policies and policy processes and institutions as they're currently configured if they're to take the climate resilience agenda as seriously as the uh, climate neutrality agenda? Yeah, I think that it is extremely important to not just discuss the mitigation track, but also understand that no matter what we do and no matter even if the world would be sort of maximum successful in doing what is needed when it comes to mitigation, which is not the path we are on right now. But even if that would happen, then we would have to sort of build much more resilient societies in Europe. And I would also say that one thing that has been very important for our mission board is that you cannot discuss adaptation and resilience without also having the other side of, of the coin, the transition that we need in order to sort of uh, reduce our emissions and reduce our environmental footprint. So the whole, I mean, the issues are hanging, uh, they, they are interconnected. So you have to do all the things in order to create truly resilient societies. And, and that is a tremendous challenge to our systems, I would say. It's it's a tremendous challenge to, to internally in the commission, I guess, uh, in governments to work across silos. It's easy to say, but how do you really do it? And how do you do it efficiently? How do you do it agile enough? It's also a challenge to our companies. How do you work together, public and private sectors? How do you work together across uh, sectors um, how do you, to a much larger extent than we are doing today, build on best practices from others and worst practices from others? There is so much knowledge and experience and know-how sitting out there, different places in Europe, but we do not know that it is there when we sit there taking decisions in a company, in a sector, in, in a government. So this whole mission is also an attempt to try to maximize the combined knowledge that we have in Europe, plus, of course, also to identify where we do not have enough knowledge today, where are there some gaps? Mm. And tell us how the, the, the mission uh, fits in, in the broader overall adaptation strategy, how it came to be part of it, because to me, it, it seems like a very interesting new departure, a, a way of trying to govern the adaptation challenge that we've not seen before? Well, originally there was this idea, should Europe start to think sort of a bit more grand? And, and these five missions came up and uh, here on uh, September 28th, they finally, uh, there, there was this communication, uh, September 29th, there was a communication from the commission saying, now there is a green light. We want to move forward with these specific five missions. And uh, we made a lot of uh, effort in, in our mission, not only to sort of make an, an implementation plan, but also to say that um, it, it must have this transformative element in it. It's not just about this standalone technology or that standalone technology. But if you read the new adaptation strategy from the Commission, you will also see that there are areas where they admit that there isn't knowledge enough. And, and that is part of what the, this um, adaptation mission uh, could do. You know, it's about technologies, yes, 
but it's also about uh, health. It's about ecosystem services. It's about uh, behavior. Behavior is uh, an important sort of part of our discussion, has been part, an important part of our discussion. Um, it's about water. It is about the enabling thing. How do we use the digi digital opportunities much better? How could we use data much, much smarter to, to shortcut to better solutions? So there are some, some needs that are not covered well enough today. And the thing that what we did in our mission board was also to say, well, often when we discuss these things, we talk about EU's member states. But actually, we target the regions. That is out where all the nice and ambitious targets must be translated into real action on the ground. And that is maybe also where they really need this way of working. Because if you sit there out in a region, in some member state, and there are not too many people working with the same issue in, in your region and in your office, uh, could we, in a smarter way, build on each other's experiences? Uh, and, and that is why we have tried to say, OK, why don't we work with 150 regions with different challenges, different strengths, but also different challenges? And from these 150 specific projects on the ground, deduct knowledge, best practice, uh, learnings that can be shared by others so that that can be used to, to scale up. And yeah. also through these projects, uh, try to identify where, where do we need some more knowledge? Where do we need some more research? And as you have seen in our mission, we also have a, a different layer where we say there should be 75 deep demonstration uh, communities where we really try and do all the right stuff and take learnings from that. How does that fit into the wider policy framework? Because often we hear that the EU policy instruments are a little bit rigid and static in their conception. For example, they protect particular nature areas, what have you. So I'm, I'm wondering what would happen, for example, if, if, if generating these new ideas, they somehow bump up against EU le e legislation that isn't necessarily as conducive as it might be to the what they're proposing. Is that captured, for example, in the, the wider mainstreaming? I think that should be a part of ex exactly what this project is all about. I mean, to do the opposite, where you could say, if you don't have these specific projects on the ground, really relating to reality as it is being perceived and experienced out regionally, then there is a risk that you make legislation that is extremely rigid. But here, actually, the whole purpose is to try to identify the diversity of the needs out there, the diversity of the challenge also. I mean, the adaptation needs will not be the same in different parts of Europe, obviously. That your, your challenges will be very, very different in different regions and different geographies. So um, I think that that is exactly what this exercise could lead to a, a smarter way of attacking the challenges. Uh, but of course, I think there is a big challenge here also for the member states to accept that we sort of, it's not the right word to say bypass the national level, but, but go one step further and work directly with the regions. I think that to some, that would be quite a, a novelty, but I think that is what is needed if we are going in Europe to be much better at building on each other's experiences. I mean, it's one of my hobby horses that we we are not really good at that, uh, good enough at that, and we should pool our resources better, our financial sources, but also our knowledge uh, sources sources, and 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 there we we could much faster get to where we say we want to be if we actually had mechanisms to allow that to happen. One of the uh, concerns of the, of the GovTran network is for um, the kind of uh, robustness, if you like, of climate policy commitments in the face of various societal trends to do with 
kind of populism and declining legitimacy, legitimacy etc. Does the mission, do the mission activities that you're describing have a, a role in that regard? I mean, do you think they are, they're part of a, a way that the, the European Union can boost its perception amongst the wider publics? Is that part of the, the, the wider mission agenda, if you like? Yes, and that's why I think it's so important not just to, you know, fix the the ambitious targets we want to reduce by 55% CO2 emissions by, by 2030, but, but if we are announcing all these nice targets and the EU Commission and the member states and everybody sort of say, this is where we want to go, and then people are not delivering on it, then I would fear that we would see a polarization accelerating in Europe with engaged young people and others that instead would turn into frustrated young people or maybe even more radicalized people who would say now we, we don't believe that the system as we know it or the institutions as we know it will be able to cope with this. So I think it's really urgent to try to work much more together than we are used to, to take it one step further and say, we can also, by working together, help you in your house, in your city, in your community to be better equipped for avoiding the worst con consequences of climate change. And of course, there is a social component here, and I'm sure that that will fill up much more space in the political talks in, in years to come on all these things. But who would normally be the most vulnerable citizens. That will also normally be those who cannot afford when suddenly uh, their house is over flooded and their insurance may not have been the best one or they have to start afresh because, you know, there was a forest fire or whatever. So I think that exactly addressing the adaptation and resilience issues could be a way also to make the whole discussion on the on the green transition in Europe much more relevant to people, much more tangible. Personally, I think that only very few people have really realized how, how much change needs to happen in how short a time here in order for the institutions, the, the states, EU, to deliver on the, the different climate uh, pledges and policies. But, but here is a chance to sort of make a vision that people want to be part of, that they can see, oh, now I understand. We're trying to build a more resilient society. It's not a society where it is gloom and doom and this you must not do and this is prohibited and this is impossible. But sort of to see, wow, that was a smarter way of doing this. This was a smarter solution. This is a more smart way of doing an infrastructure project or uh, building the, the houses in a more resilient manner or getting more resilient crops, you know, to, to bring it out there where it makes sense to people in their daily life. I do then think that sometimes in the European institutions, they are a bit optimistic as to how good they themselves would be to convey these kind of messages and to communicate these kind of things. There, I really think that those who are best to suited to, to get the messages across, that would be the politicians that are close to citizens, the companies that are close to citizens. So that is also part of this. This cannot just stay as something that the EU Commission or the EU institutions are working with. It is absolutely crucial that it gets out in a more, much more decentralized way. And that is, by the way, one of the key things that we are emphasizing in our mission, if you're interested as a region to be one of the 150 or uh, one of the 75 regions who will get the deep demonstration projects, you must also demonstrate a will to include in a deliberative manner uh, the citizens in the discussions on, on, the, on the way forward on these things. Mm. And, and but I suppose by the same token, those, those regions who get that status, they also will have an expectation of a supportive set of EU institutions backing up whatever it is that they come out with. But I mean, they'll be looking for, as I said earlier, that kind of conducive 
policy framework that may involve some modification of it, perhaps, and, and the finance, I suppose. How, is, how are they linked? Yeah, and, and finance, of course, is key. And that is why, for instance, uh, this mission, now it got the green light just here in, in the communication end of, of, of September, but they are already now in the Secretariat reaching out, for instance, to the European Investment Bank and, and to other financial institutions to try to find out how to finance this. Of course, there are uh, some uh, possibilities in the, the research and development programs uh, at the European level, but you need much more financing than that. And that's where, for instance, the European Investment Bank can play a really, really interesting role. Yeah, yeah. okay. Um, you, you've mentioned uh, the kind of scale of the challenge and, and um, how, how people will, will come to, to recognise it um, when, it's, when it's demonstrated to them on a relatively local, localised basis. But I, I also um, wanted to raise, raise the wider sort of European scale issue of, of the strains that climate impacts will place on the European Union as a whole. It will hit certain member states harder than others in certain ways. And how, how confident are you that the EU institutions have the kind of solidarity to um, support those in, in the greatest need in, in terms of the member states? Is, is adaptation and the need, and the need to ad adapt to climate impacts, is it going to be a force for integration or is it going to strain and, and, and cause the opposite process? I think that this could be an example of how we can all benefit from working more together instead of just each of us inventing you know, the wheel from, from, from scratch. Uh, and I really do think that with the EU budget uh, and with the recovery packages, I mean, there is a lot of money sitting in the system right now. And I like very much with the recovery package, the 750 billion euros uh, that was sort of agreed uh, for a rec the re recovery effort, that 37% of that amount should go, must go to climate related, the climate related transition. Whereas for the rest of the money, the heads of states agreed a principle saying, do no harm. In other words, it cannot support activities that will worsen our climate situation. And I think that that kind of thinking is really interesting. And in my view, that is also a way of making it much more visible to the citizens why it makes sense to have such a thing like an, an EU budget, why there is an added value in pooling the resources instead of just keeping it back home nationally. Uh, and I think that if you talk about some of our most vulnerable uh, member states, maybe they would benefit the most because the way that also the budget is constructed, there is, through the structural funds and through the social funds, there is a lot of money that can be, be had if you target it more into this direction. So I think it's, it's a good example of how Europe not only can set up sort of the direction and the targets and say this and that, is, this is what we want to do, but actually make a budget that is prioritized in accordance with uh, our principles and our priorities. And, and that could be done even more so, but I think that there at least we are getting on the right track. Take, for instance, the Common Agricultural Policy, which of mm. course eats up a, a, a really substantial part of the European budget. And there you can say, oh, if you're a farmer and you're getting flooded or there is drought or you have to think in different crops, I mean, if, if the EU support through the cap can be much more targeted to help you actually cope with the challenges that we know you will face in the years to come. And that would be seen, I guess, uh, in the longer run as something that is helpful in, instead of the opposite. The, the mitigation emission reduction targets have to be robust, don't they, against climate impact. So in many ways, we need to make sure that, that forests um, maintain their carbon stores and bioenergy, for example, isn't, isn't relied on too heavily in a way that might undermine adaptation goals. And 
Um, how do you how do you um, how do you see that? Do you think that the, the um, policy making on each of mitigation and adaptation policy makers are, are aware of each other's agendas? Yes, I, I think they are aware, but I think that one of the biggest challenges we face in all this, that is the complexity. You know, to really work and think and act across silos, across sectors, we need public-private cooperation like never before. We need companies to start to work together across sector lines. Uh, and I think that in all our institutions, including the political institutions, it is a challenge for the administrations, uh, for the system to sort of be up to speed, to be up to what is required, because there is this combination of complexity that they need to, to cope with and the urgency, the speed with which we need to move. And I think that is challenging our whole uh, governance structure, actually. Um, and, and just to, to say, that is also what we have seen in, in such a mission project here, because that requires a lot of stakeholders internally in the Commission just to get it sort of through. You know, it's not just one DG that can sit there and say, oh, now we are talking about adaptation. No, it's many. So it requires new forms of cooperation. For instance, the international talks then it has often been as if adaptation primarily was the issue for the developing countries, whereas it was very much up to the developed countries to take care of the, of the mitigation part. And there I think that it is dawning on, on much more people today that know these things are interlinked and must be interlinked. And what we do to cope with these challenges have to be seen in a much more holistic manner in order to create the resilient societies that we need. And that is why our mission was not just an adaptation mission, but actually a, a, a mission on how can we create, how can we transform Europe into a more resilient continent? I think that if people were in doubt this July in Belgium and Germany, people saw why that is not just the theoretical threat, it is something that also really has the potential to, to harm us a lot here in Europe if we don't get it right.